Of the great menagerie of world supernatural and paranormal beliefs, none is perhaps more ubiquitous than that of the return of the disembodied dead to haunt among the world of the living. The ghost. From haunted houses, spectral visitations, and the occasional troublesome poltergeist, tales of the unquiet dead survive survive in virtually every culture from the very earliest literature recovered. In fact, I've covered tales of some of the most ancient Sumerian ghosts ever recorded, a lonely Egyptian ghost, and a Athenian haunted house purchased and purified by a Stoic philosopher. You can check out those episodes. To this day, nearly half of Americans believe in ghosts, according to a recent poll testifying to the enduring power of spectral beliefs. And while ghost literature abounds through the ages, the most comprehensive and popular inquests about the nature of ghosts was prompted by one of the most titanic shifts in all of European religion, the Protestant Reformation. Ludwig Lavater's De Spectris, or On Ghosts, first published in German in 1569 before being translated into Latin, French, English, Dutch, Italian and going into about 20 editions makes it, without doubt, the most influential and popular of textbooks on ghosts in European history. While it's largely obscure now, many of the ghost beliefs that you may have probably have their origin in this wonderful little volume. My copy here is the second Latin edition of 1580 printed in Geneva, and it's just a lovely little book. But let's dive into this important, though now largely forgotten, textbook on ghost beliefs at the very dawn of modernity. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. And while you're at it, make sure to check out other content here on the channel and topics in esotericism. And if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on super obscure books like this wonderful text on ghosts, I'd hope you consider supporting Esoterica on Patreon. You can do a one-time donation via PayPal. You can do the little super thanks option below the video. You can even pick up some cool black metal style merch over on the merch tab. But now, Let's turn to this classic textbook on ghosts, the very same one that inspired none less than William Shakespeare to model the ghosts in Hamlet, Ludwig Lavater's De Spectris on Ghosts. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Ludwig Lavater was a Swiss Reformed theologian who worked in the circle of his father-in-law, Heinrich Bullinger. I say worked because it's really crucial to realize just how much theological labor was involved in the early days of the Reformation movement. Rejecting the Catholic Church also meant a rejection, or at least optioning out, of many core beliefs of Catholic theology, which, as you can probably surmise, required Protestant theologians to problem solve those elements, not troubleshoot those elements they felt that Catholicism basically got wrong. Of course, they came to a range of solutions evidenced by the amazing diversity, fractioning of the Protestant movement down to this very day. They sort of broke apart every time they came up with a different answer. He baptized them once, baptized them twice, and a Baptist. In this case, Lavater's father-in-law worked directly with none less than John Calvin, that's how close this guy is to John Calvin, to in fact in reinterpret issues about the baptism and especially the nature of the Lord's Supper, one of the thorniest issues in sort of the metaphysics of emergent Protestant theology. What do you do with that whole transubstantiation stuff? Well, for Lavater, the question of the nature of ghosts or spirits that appear to people was especially tricky given the Protestant rejection of both purgatory and limbo. 
The previous Catholic position that ghosts were basically spirits of the dead on leave from purgatory, purgatory is a post-mortem realm where souls of the heaven-bound, not the hell-bound, the heaven-bound, were purified of their sins through suffering. It's like micro-hell. The Protestants rejected this conception as unbiblical, because it's not really in the Bible, and therefore unchristian and an innovation, bida, on the part of the Catholic Church. This rejection of purgatory created a problem, though, for the Protestants. If ghosts aren't the souls of dead people on vacation from purgatory, because there's just no purgatory in the first place, then what gives? What explains the commonplace appearance of said ghosts? People see ghosts all the time. What are they to do and how are they to fit into the emergent, purgatory-free, Protestant religious cosmology? Where do you put ghosts in this cosmology? It's this question and other ensuing theological and metaphysical issues around ghosts that so vexes Lavater into composing what has now become probably the most important and influential textbook in all of European history, his De Spectris. Even, even the Catholics sometimes liked it. I mean, they didn't like the anti-Catholic parts, but it was full of all kinds of great ghost lore. Again, the book was translated into half a dozen languages and went into 20 editions in the first hundred years of its publication, beginning in 1569. It truly was the book on ghosts during this time and influenced everything from religious literature, especially Protestantism, and therefore had a huge impact on things like Puritanism and ghost beliefs in North America, to popular literature. William Shakespeare was reading this book when he was writing Hamlet. Lavater's De Spectris is divided into three convenient sections. The first where he establishes the reality of spectral manifestation. This does in fact happen. The second where he presents arguments about what these beings are. And a third about the correct and proper means by which a Christian can be rid of such spectral bothers. Let's discuss his arguments as they develop. Lavender spends a good bit of the first section showing that while spirits do genuinely appear to people, there are also a great many other explanations for such marvels. In, in other words, we shouldn't just ascribe any bump in the night to ghostly visitation. In fact, he discusses at length how insomnia, either through sickness, but especially through grief, can induce such ghostly hallucinations. This point about grief-induced ghost hallucinations is now well attested by psychologists. In fact, one recent study by a researcher, Agneta Grimby at the University of Gothenburg, found that over 80%, 80% of elderly people experience hallucinations associated with their dead partner one month after bereavement. Such grief hallucinations aren't the exception. They're the rule. We should be really normalizing this experience of human beings. Or they're not hallucinations. They're just ghosts. Okay. Either way, Lavater is an important early witness to this phenomenon. He is also an important witness in these pages to the reality of night terrors. In such a state, people often experience paralysis, yet are keenly, horrifyingly aware of nearby malevolent entities, and these entities may simply malinger in the general area, but they can also oppress their victims, sometimes sexually. Such night terrors, Lavater argues, form the basis of the incubus succubus tales that go back to the ancient Romans. In fact, such narratives go back to the earliest literature on ghosts to the Sumerians. Of course, mental illness, cowardice, drunkenness, and even hallucinations induced by psychoactive drugs can also make people think they're seeing ghosts. He even makes mention of a certain suffumigation which can make people around a table appear to have no heads, or have the heads of donkeys, or make it appear that strange vines are growing up about the ceiling. He even mentions that there are books about such drugs. Now, he doesn't name names here, but I strongly suspect he's referring to Delaporta's book on natural magic, wherein he describes various kinds of potions that you should never try to make uh, that are said to make one go insane for an afternoon or go insane for a day. One of the earliest publications actually describing the recreational use of psychedelic drugs in all of European literature. In fact, I've done an episode on just that section of Delaporta's book if you want to check that out. It's amusing. 
He gives his friend psychedelic drugs without informing them because he's not a very ethical person. Lavender also dwells at length on some pretty humorous tales of people pretending to be ghosts for a range of reasons, mostly to torment people and seduce women. He even recounts a tale that happened Hulk Anno 1569, in this year, 1569, the year when the book came out, where a Jesuit dressed up like the devil to frighten some servants uh, that worked in a house that had been bad-mouthing the Society of Jesus. They'd been bad-mouthing the Jesuits. Well, it did scare some of the maids, but one other guy got a dagger and stabbed the pseudo-Satan to death. Now, it's pretty chutzpah dick to try to stab a demon, but I guess you don't have a lot of other options. But the real lesson here is don't dress up as Satan and break into people's houses because they might stab you. Of course, Lavater, the Protestant, mostly uses a lot of these sections to beat up on the Catholics, because of course he does. Though, despite the shade thrown, he does make a very astute observation about, about the Catholic Church. That is, that some of the Catholic clergy employ exorcistic rituals and other spellcraft to summon spirits for various ends. He's referring to what we now call the clerical necromantic underground. That strata of largely lower level, though exorcistically trained priests who were responsible for the production and practice of necromantic demon magic through most of the Middle Ages and the early modern period. This is a well-attested phenomenon that we now know really existed, and it's testified by the various numerous magical manuals that have survived down to this day. I've, in fact, I've done several episodes about these volumes like CLM 849, the Munich Necromancer's Manual, and the Clerical Necromantic Underground is one of the mainstay topics on this channel. Hell, I even have a Clerical Necromantic Underground shirt on my merch store. So. Thanks, clerical underground necromancers, and to the great Richard Kiekeffer for coining that term. Thank you. But yes, Lavender does think that necromancers are responsible for some of these troublesome spirits. I mean, folks, please make sure to practice any and all banishings to keep the space clear of any vexing spirits for the rest of us. Finally, Lavender describes a range of other natural factors that can make a person think that there's a ghost, but there really isn't. They're just illusions, various kinds of natural phenomena, the sounds of strange animals, like a drafty window can make you think that there's a ghost. Those things are not ghosts. But he does believe that there are spirits out there and they do appear to people. After ruling out cases of like pseudo-ghosts or necromantically induced spiritual appearances, Lavater then dives into classical literature, the early church fathers, ancient chronicles, and other trusted authors. This is basically other Protestants that he likes, like Melanchthon, and of course the good old Bible to establish that such spectral reality is real. There really are spirits that do appear to people and sometimes perform marvelous deeds, like predicting storms, wars, and other kinds of things. So they do show up and they can seem to know the future. In fact, the whole title in the early modern English edition is Of Ghosts and Spirits Walking by Night and of strange noises, cracks, and sundry forewarnings, which commonly happen before the death of men, great slaughters, and alterations of kingdoms. Why don't we give books titles like that anymore? It's just a fantastic title. They just do troublesome things also, like break stuff, bang things, and generally bother people. This is what we would now refer to as poltergeist activity. We also learn that such appearances, while declining in Europe, are actually just everyday occurrences in the New World. So, this should place to be real haunted. Yeah, the Americas are just super haunted, according to Lavender. Why, you ask? Because such spirits are generally terrified of true Christianity, i.e. Protestantism. And with the Reformation of the Church, especially evil spirits just can't appear at all. So there's not many in... Geneva, I guess, but in the wilds of America with Native Americans and the lands otherwise beset with pagan papistry, then those areas are full of all kinds of spirits. Such entities abound. The first chapter of the book, actually, is just a whole system of spirit classification. So if you want to get your gorgons separated from your other ghosts, 
They can even shapeshift. They can harm people and animals. They can throw things about and even appear as the living. They can appear like living people. And in fact, they can even pose as a living to frame them for committing sins. Lavender recounts the colorful tale that he heard from the prefect of Zurich of a man witnessing a friend of his having sex with a mare in a field. Yep, that. But this was so out of character that he rushed home to the man's home only to find him fast asleep in bed. Clearly, we're told, this was a case where a spirit was trying to frame this guy for having sex with a mare in a field. And then this episode got really weird all of a sudden. There's some... You can see why people like this book. It's full of weird stuff like that. Further, such entities are especially said to haunt minds, and he even blames them and names them as kobolds in the German language. Now, while not generally a danger, kobolds in numbers can threaten even lower-level adventurers. That's not in... that's not in Lavender. I think I'm quoting from the Monster Manual. At any rate, but yes, kobolds in minds do make an appearance in De Spectris. Okay, you probably noticed that Lavender's really using the term spectrix to cover a wide range of entities beyond what we typically think of as ghosts, that is, the disembodied spirits of the dead. In fact, this really goes to the very heart of his theory of what he thinks is going on with these ghosts and spirits and kobolds. For Lavender, these beings are, I mean, you can probably guess, they're almost always just demons tormenting people, as demons are wont to do. In rarer cases, they might be angels, according to Lavender, but God really rarely sends angels out anymore because since Christ and the Reformed Church, God has kind of communicated all we, we need to know, according to Lavender. So you don't really need angels, which are just divine messengers. They just bring messages from God. We don't need those anymore because God's already dropped a dime for humanity in the, in the Reformed Church and the Gospels. Finally, in other very rare cases, God might send the spirit of a dead person for some very specific task, but Lavender is very slow to admit this happens very much at all. In fact, even demons can temporarily do a good task or ask you to do a good task in the long-term hopes of getting you to commit a sin. So even a good ghost or spirit isn't really so much trustworthy. Take that, Casper. So when in doubt, you should treat basically all specters as, as demons. They're just probably all demons. Now, what do we do about these entities? Well, you certainly don't engage with a range of Catholic superstitions, such as relics and holy water and incense, etc. None of that. That's all paganism for Lavender. In fact, Lavender even argues that that can make the problem worse. Because it's not really Christianity, it's just evil. Again, you never miss a chance to shade the Catholics and in, in in these Protestants. Basically, the answer is what you guess. You, you pray, and you get others to pray with you, and... If the being is a demon, then it can't hurt you without God's permission, so... And if it is your time to, you know, play your best job to get tortured by a demon, then you endure such demonic vexations with the patience and Christian forbearance that you should as a good Protestant. If it's an angel, then you don't have anything to fear. Though angels always say, fear not, when they show up, so... That's not true. Generally speaking, you just ignore ghostly going on, you pray them away, and you be super Protestant. That's Lavater's answer. Thus, Lavater's position is sort of an interesting in-between the quasi-official position of the Catholic Church that posits the existence of both demons and disembodied spirits of the dead, and the latter more skeptical and frankly much less popular position that was taken by Reginald Scott in his discourse upon devils and spirits that eventually became appended to his 1584 work, The Discovery of Witchcraft, which is just very, very important in the history of all this, where he argued that because of the Age of Miracles had long since ceased, apparitions must basically just be products of human imagination or trickery. There just aren't these kind of marvels anymore. There used to be, but not anymore. For Lavender, there are spirits, but they're overwhelmingly demonic in nature, a position that has really become basically more or less the mainstream position among official Protestantism, as much as there's one position about this. Your mileage will, of course, vary with, with actual Protestants. All in all, Lavater's De Spectris was widely read and hugely influential on European-wide ghost beliefs. In fact, aside from his specifically Protestant theological positions that are laid out 
the book is just full of tons of wonderful ghost lore taken from everything from classical sources to random stories he's heard from that prefect in Zurich about the guy having sex with the mayor. In that way, it's a must read for anyone interested in ghosts as entities, but also the role of ghosts in the history of lore and literature. Again, again, while obscure now, Lavater's De Spectris is just fundamental to how ghost narratives developed in modernity and contemporary Europe, especially including romantic literature, especially via English romantic literature via its influence on Reginald Scott, and the modern ghost story from Shakespeare and Hamlet to Shirley Jackson and, I don't know, the Amityville Horror. They're all somehow downstream of Lavater. Luckily, it's been translated into a range of languages, and even the early English edition, it's old-timey English, is still really well translated and widely available online and in reprint. You can get it for next to nothing. You just have to get used to reading it in the sort of fractor type print, but somehow that adds to the ghostly fun. It's also just fun to read in Latin, which if you read some Latin, it's actually really well translated and it, it's, it's fun to read in Latin. It's not hard Latin, all things told. So what better practice to work on your Latin than reading a fun book about ghosts? You can find it on archive.org. Of course, we'll continue keeping up our tradition of telling historical ghost stories for Christmas time, but until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, religion, and ghosts.